Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Today we are commemorating one of the most tragic, one of the most painful, one of the most outrageous events in all of history, and yet a huge paradox. Here is the Saviour of the world, the Son of God, whipped, stripped, nailed to the cross and insulted. This is the ultimate cost to God of coming amongst us. He showed his love for us, giving for us the ultimate sacrifice. And because of this cost, we must stay and watch today. But we belong here waiting and watching in this commemoration, not just because Christ died for us, but also because we have helped to crucify him. It is the sinfulness of our humanity, our sin and our turning from God, which brings about this crucifixion. Behold the truth. God's messenger, his son, sent into the world with his message and his example of love and pardon and peace, showing to humanity the truest and holiest and highest form of human life that humanity has ever known. And the only answer that man can give is to put him to the cruelest and most painful death that has ever been devised. Man tells God that he does not want him. And in many ways we still do the same. This is what sin is about the cruel and insulting rejection of God and of his rightful claims upon the gratitude and service of all humanity. And it happens all the time when we ruin our family lives, when we support wars, when we live in injustice, when there's imbalances in society, when we encourage hatred, when we live in hatred. In so many ways, we are part of the sin that divides, the sin that crucifies. But our sin is all the greater because we reject not just our Creator and King, but we reject our loving Father who loves us eternally. He has given himself to us and he loves us all the time despite it all. So our rejection is even more powerful, even more hurtful. Surely every sin of ours stabs right into the heart of God who loves us, just as surely as the nail drives through flesh and bone. And in the midst of that agony, that rejection of our humanity against God, Jesus cries, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was once pointed out to me by a nun that Jesus did not say, I forgive them, but rather, Father, forgive them. Is it remotely possible that at this one moment, this of the extreme pain and reality of rejection was so great that he could not at that moment personally forgive, but knew that his father could and would. He wanted to forgive us, and he did. And that is how much he loved us, even in the midst of such horror. For all the sins of our lives, Jesus being nailed to the cross, by those sins, cries, Father, forgive them. This is not a grudging forgiveness. It's uttered from the depths of his wounded heart, even while we are still engrossed in our sin. This is the love which offers hope and reconciliation in a divided and troubled world, and it's the love which we are called to emulate, even though it is sacrificial and it's a struggle and it's costly. 
This is the love in the midst of pain and struggle, which offers the hope of transformation of new life and of light. And so a short prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, who is always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and always ready to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and granting us those things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I assure you, today, you will be with me in paradise. As Jesus hung on the cross, he was mocked by the leaders and the soldiers. One of the criminals with him added his own measure of scorn. But the other crucified criminal, he sensed that Jesus was treated unjustly. And after speaking up for him, he cried out, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus responded to this criminal, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise from the Greek, the word paradisos, means garden. It was used in the Old Testament as a word for the Garden of Eden. In Judaism, at the time of Jesus, it was associated with heaven and also with the future when God would restore all things to the perfection of a garden. Paradise was sometimes thought to be the place where the righteous people went after death. And this seems to be the way in which Jesus uses paradise in that passage. Here we have encountered one of the most astounding and encouraging verses in all scripture. Jesus promised that the criminal would be with him in paradise. Yet the text of Luke gives us no reason to believe that this man was a follower of Christ or a believer in him in any way or in any way a good person. He might have felt sorry for his sins, we suppose, but he did not obviously repent. Rather, the criminal's cry to be remembered seems more like a desperate, last-ditch attempt. Though, of course, we should make every effort to have the right theology. And though we should live our lives each day as a disciple of Jesus, in the end, our relationship with him comes down to the simple trust. Jesus, remember me, we cry. And Jesus, embodying the mercy of God, says to us, you will be with us, with me, in paradise. We are welcome there, not because we have the right theology, not because we are living rightly, but because God is merciful and we have put our trust in him.
So I wonder if we reflect for a moment, how have we staked our life on Jesus? Have we? Have we put our ultimate trust in him? Do you know that when your time comes, you will be with him in paradise? Do you have that trust? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I wonder at your grace and mercy. When we cry out to you, you hear us. When we ask to rem- you to remember us, when you come into your kingdom, you offer us the promise of paradise. Your mercy, dear Lord, exceeds anything we might imagine. It embraces us, it encourage us, encourages us, heals us. O oh Lord, though my situation is so different from the criminal who cried out to you, I am nevertheless quite like him. Today I live, trusting you and you alone. My life, but now and in the world to come, is in your hands. And so I pray, Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me today as I seek to live within your kingdom. Amen. God bless. From the cross, Jesus said these words. Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. In the midst of his misery, Jesus dispenses grace on those around him. He has asked forgiveness for his tormentors. He has assured the second thief, that he would find himself in paradise that very day. In great agony, he turns to those who are closest to him, the disciple whom he loved and his mother. Although it does seem strange to talk of a disciple whom Jesus loved, didn't he love all his disciples? Of course he did. But for some reason, at this particular moment, this was a disciple who was there at the foot of the cross. He was actually supporting Jesus at the end of his life. And that was something, considering most of his followers had actually run away and deserted him out of cowardice. It was thought that the disciple was John, son of Zebedee, but we do not know for sure. But whoever it was, this beloved disciple, Jesus was giving the disciple something to live for, giving him trust. He had such faith in his friend. He was also using this last opportunity to comfort his friend, because he was hurting too. Not as much as Jesus' mother, 
but nevertheless terribly hurting. That hurt may have been tinged with perhaps a feeling of guilt. Guilt because, well, maybe he could have done more, especially when Jesus was being condemned to death. How many times do we feel guilty? Especially when we could have done more to prevent something awful happening to someone we knew. Then afterwards, we find that we are forgiven, not only by God, but sometimes by the person we could have saved from a lot of hurt. And why didn't we? Because we were too scared to stand up for them, scared for our own life or reputation. But there was Jesus' mother standing by the cross. The anguish, the sorrow she must have been going through, staring up at her son who had been bullied, broken and was now badly bleeding. What a sight that many of us would have found hard to look at. But for a mother, it was truly awful. We have difficulty witnessing what one human being that is a stranger to us can do to another. How many times are murderous scenes on the news cut from our television screens because they are too shocking to look at? But this was Mary's son, her own flesh and blood. Now life had not been easy for Mary, not since the day the angel had visited her, saying, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. She was pregnant before she was married, and there was shame. She gave birth while travelling and had to cradle her baby in a feeding trough. There was hardship and rejection. The little family had to flee to Egypt to escape murderous Herod. And Simeon, in the temple, when Jesus was only 40 days old, predicted that a sword would pierce her heart. That sword was piercing her heart now. The presence of Mary at the cross adds both humanity and horror to the scene. It may seem strange, but contrary to custom and expectation, that Jesus is not handing over the care of his mother to his brothers. But here is an important and new relationship between Mary and the beloved disciple, and has tremendous significance to us even today. For it, it illustrates that we belong to the Mother Church, in the same way, it should remind us that we are not merely a congregation, but also a community. A community that has the scope to provide comfort and healing and joy. To lift the spirits of those who come to us feeling burdened or afraid or alone. A community where we can learn to bear one another's burdens just as a mother loves and supports her own child. Because as these lines from St John's Gospel remind us, in that astonishing moment, in the account of the crucifixion, we are charged to be here for one another. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And so let us play, pray. O blessed Saviour, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, 
as you cared for your family then, continue to care for your family now, for all our brothers and sisters who live in fear or in hunger or in need. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mark 15.34 tells us that at the ninth hour, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? At this time, Jesus is dying the most terrible death, the death of the cross, the penalty the Romans used to execute criminals. Indeed, on the day Christ died, there were two criminals facing the same fate. There cannot be many other scenes from history which are so familiar to us all and so agonisingly brutal. When I visualise this scene, I see the Roman soldiers despising Jesus, jeering and mocking him, spitting at him and dividing up his robes, not seeming to have any conscience about the barbaric act they have just committed. There were the two criminals, one who seemed to understand who Jesus was and asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus replies, Today you will be with me in paradise. And then there are the women standing at the bottom of the cross weeping. One of these women was Mary, Jesus' mother. As a mother myself, I cannot begin to imagine how terrible that experience must have been for her. She did have the comfort of Mary Magdalene and others, but how can one be comforted at such a dreadful time? Then, when she must have felt that it couldn't get any worse, Jesus cries out, Aloi, Aloi, Lama, Sabachthani, which is translated as, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I wonder, did Mary feel like this was the ultimate abandonment? At the very point of his severest pain and suffering, Jesus seems to be telling Mary that he feels his father has abandoned him. When our loved ones are dying, we want to be there for them, right to the end, and more importantly, we want them to know we are there. If I had been Mary, I would have felt confused and crushed to hear this cry. However, for many years I took comfort from these words to know that even Jesus, the man who was without sin, the one who always knew what to say, how to respond to questions, the one who performed amazing miracles, at his end he showed what it was to be human, just like me. However, it is still a puzzle. Why did Jesus say this? Did he really feel abandoned by God, his Father? After all, when we feel everything is lost, when we feel life can't get any worse, we do feel abandoned. However, Hebrews 13.5 tells us, I will never leave you or forsake you. And if God will do that for us mere mortals, I am sure he will do that for his only son. No, in those awful moments, as evil men were allowed to do whatever they wanted to Jesus, God placed the sins of the world on his son and Jesus for a time felt the desolation of being unconscious of his father's presence. So this is it. This is the moment when Jesus takes on the sins of the world, the sins of you and I, 
so that at the very moment we first acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and that he has died in our place and has taken our sin, we can live our lives here and now in the knowledge and wonder of being forgiven. What a cause for celebration. And what about Mary? Was there any comfort for her in these words? I think there was. She had been given knowledge from God even before Jesus' conception that this person was special, God's own son. I'm also sure she knew the scriptures well and recognised the cry, Why have you abandoned me? from Psalm 22. And maybe it was Jesus somehow reminding, reassuring her of how his father had taken care of David in his darkest moments. As if this wasn't enough, this poem also reminds us that God will never abandon us. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me and one to the Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I follow, follow, decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Amen. After this, aware that everything was now finished, and in order that scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. I thirst. How often in our lives have we actually really, really thirsted? There's something very, very powerful in the midst of the agony of the cross, the physical agony. Then comes this physical and also the spiritual thirst. And it's the spiritual thirst, the meaning of that, those words, every word on the cross has powerful meaning that Jesus says. We know what the spiritual... Do we really know what the spirit of the, the physical words mean? I thirst. When we thirst, we yearn for that which gives life. Water is life giving. The image of water is there throughout the scriptures, and we've seen images of water in these reflections as well. It is the very essence of life. Jesus is crying, I thirst for the essence of life. In scripture, water is an, a symbol of both life and death, but it is of much more. It's the very stuff that gives life to humanity. 
what is it that gives life to humanity? In the Old Testament, there are images, the thirst comes in, in other images, like in Amos. Amos says, let justice roll like a river, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, waters flowing out, enriching, so that we may never thirst or need. And that what that here we need to talk of justice and righteousness, so that the needs of the world are fulfilled. In Isaiah, Isaiah speaks, I will pour out water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Jesus, as a rabbi on the cross, would have had such images and very much in his mind from Amos and Isaiah embedded within his, in his being. And so when he cries, I thirst, there's much more than just the physical need that is there. Remember that just not long before um, he had met the Samaritan woman at the well and had that amazing conversation about water. Um, and, and he had said to the woman, Samaritan woman at the well, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so the thirst that he speaks of there, that will be quenched, is eternal life that is brought to humanity through him. That, th that cry from Jesus on the cross, I thirst, is therefore an echo to a much deeper than the physical. I thirst for justice. I thirst for righteousness. I thirst for that for make, which, which makes for eternal life. I cry out. I yearn for it. Remember um, in the, on the Mount of Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, probably the most famous of Jesus' teachings, there when talking to the ordinary people, a transformative message to humanity. One of the key messages there was, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I thirst. Jesus, in the midst of the agony on the cross, in the utter abandonment um, where all his followers have left him, where the world has turned against him, yet his cry is a thirst for righteousness, a thirst for justice, a thirst for us, a prayer for us, a thirst for eternal life, for humanity. And therefore, if we are to follow this, this journey on the cross, and if we are to be disciples of Jesus, we too are called to thirst for justice and righteousness, and to thirst for that which makes for eternal life, to carry, to share in his journey, and to be his disciples in that calling. So let us pray. Lord, as you cried, I thirst on the cross, so as we journey with you in this moment, so may our souls and our lives thirst for righteousness and justice and for all that makes for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
It is finished. It is complete. Not failure, but victory. John slips these three words into his account of Jesus' last moments. It's a loud cry in the other Gospels, but John makes it specific. In the midst of pain and suffering, John says, Jesus declares something finished, done, complete. It's not the end, but something important has happened. Lent and Easter are very important to me, and there's something in there that I find a bit of a challenge, a little bit of make-believe. The problem is that I know what happens next. It's a bit like re-watching a favourite film. We know all the twists, the spoilers. We know the betrayal, the crucifixion, the cliffhanger. It's really hard not to be always thinking forward to the resurrection. Within three days, Jesus will be raised. Within three months, God pours out his spirit at Pentecost. Within 300 years, the Roman Empire, which so casually and brutally crushed Jesus, adopts Christianity as the official state religion. But the disciples didn't know any of that. They knew what Jesus had told them throughout his ministry, his challenging of what they, what everyone else thought. He even told them what would happen. But they weren't ready to deal with something so outrageous until it happened and not really even then. At Easter I think about their fragile hopes, their fears and their wonder, and I often find it hard to reflect on the difficulties that Jesus' followers faced when they are so alien to my life. Well, we're all in a bit of an alien world right now, and we don't yet know where and how this will end. So I think I'm feeling a bit more of a connection this year, and it's not terribly comfortable, I have to say. I suspect I'm not alone in that. It does make me think about sacrifice and how I can live out what Jesus died for. Dying on the cross, along with the hopes of the disciples, was that really how it was meant to end? And just as in life he turned everything upside down, Jesus, dying on the cross, does it again. It is finished. It is complete. Jesus has done what he set out to achieve, something world-changing. God who lived as flesh and blood, who came not to dominate, but to love, to serve, to obey, Jesus fulfills his life. He accepts death, risks all, and brings us to God. It's not the end. We still have to mourn, to wait for the resurrection. Jesus has to be set free from death itself. And only then will the disciples really start to work out what they've been told. In the midst of despair, great sacrifice, great love. In our current uncertain times, we see a lot of people loving, serving and giving of themselves. It's a good model for Easter. And the cross challenges me to keep living that life. It is complete, not failure, but victory. It is finished. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
Commending his spirit to God was Jesus' greatest teaching. Jesus teaches that putting our own lives into God's hands is the most powerful way of bringing about world change. Jesus commended his spirit to God as a culmination of a life of humility, wisdom, courage, compassion, peacefulness and selflessness. Jesus surrendered his life to serve the cause of God in the world. One of the last acts of humility that Jesus taught us was to wash the feet of his disciples. Jesus taught us that surrender means being a willing servant. Death surrenders all of us totally to God. But what about life? When used in the spiritual context of our daily lives, commending our spirit to God means surrendering our lives and striving to give up everything that serves ourselves. In post-Christian society, many people have no experience of the teachings of Jesus. Many people have no knowledge of the fact that Jesus called his disciples to participate with him in his death. This meant denying their own egos and taking up the cross daily. Many people have no idea that by emulating Christ's humble surrender, we enable God to do the inner work required to transform us, ordinary human beings, into God's likeness. Many people have no idea that by giving our lives to God, we might become like him. We Christians must not limit the power of Christ just to ourselves. Christ works in the lives of all people. The recent teachings of a religious sister compared Jesus' humble foot washing service with that of frontline health workers. She believes that they say through their actions, I choose to wash your feet. I choose to work tirelessly for you. I choose to put my own health on the line. I choose to think positively. I choose to follow government instructions. And I do this because I love you, my fellow human being. For Sister Mary Turner, God is literally kneeling down through the actions of these ordinary workers. Workers who have commended their spirit and lives to serve the greater good in the world. As Christ said, as I have done, so you must do. We all need to learn to kneel, because what we do for others, we do for Christ. In the early church, the means to achieve surrender was often taught within the enclosure of a Benedictine monastery. Those living the religious life sought to ascend each step of the ladder of humility. St Benedict says in an early Christian document that by our ascending actions we arrive at the perfect love of God and therefore perfect love of each other. This in turn leads to a peaceful life where burdens are held lightly and we are freed from harmful actions arising from our own anxiety and fear. Like Jesus, Mary his mother teaches us what it means to commend one's own spirit to God. Let it be done unto me, Mary said. Mary's own surrender literally allowed God to come and dwell in her. Whatever our work or calling, in surrender we all work on the front line for God. We actively strive for each other. In so doing, we participate in the kingdom by agreeing to God's will and action for the greater good in our own lives. Commending our spirit means that rather than praying for or wishing for situations to be changed by God or to ask God to do something for us, we pray for our own inner change. We pray that God may work in us so that we can help him change situations. When we commend our lives to God, God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit and we become strong enough to work for good by stepping away from self-interested greed, prejudice, violence and negativity. Humanity doing this collectively manifests God's power in society, 
creating space for gratitude, peace and unconditional love. In recent centuries, the focus of Jesus' death on the cross as God's only means of redemption has seemingly limited God's power. It seems that God's power is only active in the lives of a diminishing number of baptised and practising Christians. Today, 2,000 years after Jesus' own surrender, we see that Christ is bigger than the church. We see what surrender looks like for ordinary people who may not believe. Yet the action and will of God shines forth in their lives. Today, the willingness of frontline workers to suffer for the good of others shows that humanity lives in the power of Christ's spirit and does so for the greater good and for the cause of God in the world. The message of personal sacrifice and surrender represented by the cross is good news for us all. Today we see that surrendering the human spirit for the greater good saves lives on the front line. The coming Easter message is that the spirit of Christ lives and we are all citizens in God's kingdom.